I want to go into the Old Testament for a little bit as we set up for looking at chapter 2, what Paul says to the Jews that he's writing to in chapter 2. Because what he's going to say to the Jews in chapter 2 of uh, Romans uh, is it's basically a spiritual problem that they've had for hundreds of years, which leads to the premise, which is a whole other sermon, but some, some sins and family lines kind of hang on for generations. Uh, the problem with uh, uh, the Jewish uh, issue that Paul's is going to address in chapter 2 of Romans is one uh, that uh, was clearly seen uh, as the kingdom began to implode. I'm talking about the southern kingdom of the two tribes uh, as they began to implode from not being obedient to God's law uh, in his prophets. Um, they were going to be invaded by the Babylonians in a series of invasions starting in around 605, 606 BC. Uh, and at, prior to the invasion that God's going to discipline them through the hand of the Babylonians, uh, he sends prophets to warn them, to call them back to following him. Notice what he says in, uh, Jeremiah says in chapter 7, concerning the spiritual deception of his people prior to invasion. He says in uh, verse 2, when you think about people coming to worship at the temple in Jerusalem, God says, uh, Jeremiah, here's what I want you to tell the worshipers that come to the temple. It says, stand in the gate of the Lord's house, the temple, and proclaim there this word and say, quote, hear the word of the Lord, all you Judah who enter by these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts. Uh, that's the Hebrew word, Shabbat, for armies, the God of armies, angelic armies, the God of Israel. So to mend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words like what? Well, the prophets and the priests were given the, the, the nation false words of comfort when invasion was nigh. What was the, the, the mantra? Well, they chanted this constantly. This is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. It's kind of a Trinitarian motif. Uh, they would quote this basically to someone like Jeremiah who said uh, judgment is nigh by saying, God will not judge this place. The temple's here. He certainly wouldn't attack himself. That's the deception. Verse 5, God says, For if you truly amend your ways and your deeds, if you truly practice justice between man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, or the widow, all the things they were doing, or do not shed innocent blood in this place, nor walk after other gods to your own ruin, and they brought the false gods even within the temple's precincts proper. Then God says, if you do those things, then I will let you dwell in this place and in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, God says, uh, that's, and that's emphatic in Hebrew. He says, behold, you are trusting in deceptive words to no avail. What your prophets and your priests and your politicians are telling you doesn't match reality. I'm going to judge you and discipline you because you've walked away from the word of God. Sound familiar? See, the, the Jews in that day believed that God would not allow Jerusalem to fall. Why? One main thing was there the temple. And God through Jeremiah's pen says, do not be deceived. Uh, when, you, when you look at uh, the Old Testament, there's another time years prior to this that God told them the same thing. This time he told them uh, through the, the life of King Saul. Uh, God had told King Saul, follow me perfectly to the letter. Do not deviate. And Saul's going to modify his obedience to God. Samuel's then going to approach uh, the king with these words in 1 Samuel 15. Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? I mean, he's bringing all these sacrifices, trying to cover the fact that he didn't totally obey God. He says, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. God could care less, Saul, about all your sacrifices. He wants obedience without any waffling. He says, and to heed is more important than, than this, than the fat of rams. For rebellion is, is as a sin of divination. Insubordination is, a, is iniquity and idolatry. Because you rejected the word of the Lord, like modified it and only obeyed it like, as much as you wanted to, the Lord has rejected you from being the king. There's consequences to disobedience. See, Israel had this uh, sin in their culture for many, many years. Saul did it. The nation did it. As goes the leader, so goes the people. A fish rots from the head down. You understand this? And this is what happened. And so Paul, fast forward to Paul's day, uh, some 600 years later when he's writing his letter to the Romans. Uh, there's a Jewish contingent in the, in the church. He's writing to the Jewish contingent in chapter 2. He's preparing to come to them to teach and, and minister among them. And he's writing the Roman letter to them to introduce himself and his teachings to them. Uh, and he's talking, in, as we saw in chapter 1, about the glory of the gospel of the Messiah, the Messiah, Jesus. And he's, he's been talking about them. And the whole first chapter is about the Gentile, basically the Gentile problem with sin. 
And he's been waxing eloquent about the Gentile world of sin. And every Jew listening to him, I'm sure, was high-fiving Paul going, go get them. It's exactly how Gentiles are. Because remember, if we, if we have to review because it's been several weeks. So I'm assuming a few brain cells have died. And you need to be brought back up to speed, right? What in the world were we talking about back then? We were talking about uh, Romans 1.18 where Paul says, Every man's born with a concept that God exists. In fact, he says in Romans 1, 18 and following, you can look at the, the cosmological argument and understand Trinitarianism. That's what he says. He says they can see the Godhead. How so? From complexity must be one who's more complex than the complexity. God. Uh, and what kind of God would that be? Well, a monotheistic version of God that you can define to a point, but then it's beyond your ability to understand it with a finite mind. That's what he's talking about in chapter 1. They suppress the truth of God's uh, existence. And because they do that, they become a law unto themselves. And because they do that, well, then they have all kinds of moral issues that he says degenerate down to the conscience dies. Well, that whole spiral of sin that Paul described in chapter 1 was the one the Jews would look at and go, well, that's certainly not us. Well, Paul then turns to them in chapter 2 and says, oh, you're moralist. You're religious moralist. You think that you're clean before God? Let me address you because your sin is, is dangerous. So he's going to respond to them uh, in, in a powerful way in the first 16 verses, and we'll finish it up. There's more than just the first 16, but this little motif right here is God responding through the pen of Paul to the Jewish moralist. That's the context. But what he's going to say to a Jewish moralist is going to apply to anybody who thinks, I'm going to get into heaven because my mother was religious. I've got religious books in my you see what I mean? When I was, I'm serious. I've heard all these things. When I was a sheriff chaplain, I didn't share this in the other services. We have more time. Um, when I was a sheriff chaplain, they called me to, to do a funeral for the sheriff's department. So I went to the house, interviewed the, the, the wife of the deceased. And, and I said, you know, um, you know, tell me about your husband. So she's and I, like, like what? Well, what words would describe him? Adjectives. What? So she's describing him and, and, uh, and, uh, and she said, uh, and, and you know, you know, you know, chaplain, he was a godly, godly man. I go, really? How did you know that? Well, yeah, he, he had a Bible. <laughs> Neato. <laughs> After, it's a Greek word. Uh, uh, can, I, can I see his Bible? She goes, oh, yeah, absolutely. So she goes and gets it, and she hands it to me. I think I cracked it open for the first time. <laughs> Nothing in it. Not even a, I mean, not even a bookmark. Not a pencil, underline them, nothing. And I'm beginning to look at this, listen to her, and I'm thinking, really? Because if he was a godly man, what would he be doing? He'd be reading the word of God. Go back to my sermon. What was I talking about? Um, you could say, say, I've got a Bible, and therefore I'm going to heaven because I've got a Bible. No, you're not. No, you're not. See, you can be the religious moralist and wind up not ever seeing God. And that's what Paul's trying to warn the, the moralistic Jew who believes that they're going to heaven because, well, I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew. And Liz's side of the family, this is their argument. I mean, I've sat down with them from New York and we've talked theology. Those are, we're Jewish. Okay. What'd you do with the Messiah, the Messiah? I mean, Jesus, you know, what do you do with him? Uh, and so Paul, who understands who the Messiah is, is trying to wake up his Jewish brethren. So he's going to give you the answers of what God says to that Jewish moralist. Uh, and we'll review. We're still reviewing. I'll eventually get to my sermon. Hang on. Verse 1, what did he say? Well, God says, uh, I, I need to supply the reason for divine judgment. If you think the Gentile world is evil, don't think that the Jewish world cannot be evil as well. There's reasons why God comes in judgment. And sometimes the sins are internal. And because you're not doing the external thing, you're thinking you're okay. You're not. Then he, uh, he tells the Jewish moralists in verses 2 to 4 that when God comes in judgment, his judgment is always right. Because he has the facts. He never misses anything because he's omniscient. And then it says in verses 5 to 11 that uh, there's a road of divine judgment. And the road terminates with you have a vault. I mean you as a person. God, he's, what he says, you have like a vault. And every time when you've rejected Christ as your Lord, you live as a law unto yourself. When you sin, you make a deposit in said vault. On the day God judges you, what's he do? He's just. He says we need to consider their vault. What's in it? Well, Paul talks the vault of wrath. So that when he judges you, it's based on the facts of your deposits, which leave you standing uh, before God guilty. Better option, I would tell you right up front, is just come to Christ. But anyway, 
Paul's going to uh, talk to the Jewish moralist in verses uh, 12 to 16 and add the next dimension that God supplies the reality of the divine judgment. I mean, it, it's going to... It's going to be real. And here's how it's going to be real. How God's going to go about judging people. It says in verse 12. He says, For all of who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. That's a Gentile. The law here is substitute the word Torah. So it, 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 Gentiles don't have the Torah. They'll still be judged. Then he says, All who have sinned under the law, i.e. the Jew who has the Torah, will be judged by the law or the Torah. Then think about the Torah for just a minute. How many big commandments are there? It's test time. There's not nine, there's not 11. Now yeah, you're cheating. Okay, there's 10. The 10 big commandments, okay? And then beyond that, there are 613 additional ones. So just park that in your brain for just a minute. So if you want, if you want to reject the Christ, how you, will you be judged before the living God in eternity? Based upon your obedience or lack thereof to 600 and excellent mathematics, excellent. Let X equal and you can figure it out. Um, 623 commandments? Who's going to fulfill all those? Only one Jew ever did. Only one man ever did. His name? Jesus. Anyway, we'll get back to him in just a minute. It says, For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law, the Torah, do instinctively the things of the Torah, the law, these not having the law, the Torah, are a law to themselves. So the Gentiles have their own law. It's just not the Torah. But it, it's similar to the Torah. It says, in that they show the work of the law, the Torah, written where? Not on a scroll, but where? In their heart. In their heart. Uh, they are a law unto themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness. Notice the present tense nature of the participle. It bears witness constantly, uh, and their thoughts alternatively, accusing or else defending them. You know, your little conscience that comes along and says, you shouldn't do that. You should do this. And you're like, no, I'm going to do this etc. Your conscience then condemns you. Uh, he says, on that day when history terminates, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets, the things that you held, uh, held away from everybody else. He'll judge the secrets of man through Jesus Christ. Judgment day is coming. Are you ready for judgment day? You'll be judged in two ways, either based on the law, internal law or external law, or you have the righteousness of Christ because you came to Christ in faith. I mean, it's your choice. And I would pray that you would choose the, the latter. So Paul's trying to wake up those who are spiritually deceived, the, the Jews who thought, oh, well, I'm getting into heaven because I'm a Jew and I have the Torah. And he says, not so. And to any Gentile standing there going, hey, Paul, I'm kind of thinking God gave the Gentiles a leg up on heaven by giving them the law. I mean, what do we have? Paul says, uh, not so. You have the own law. It's written in your heart. So no Gentile could sit there and say, well, I deserve heaven uh, because uh, I had no idea what God wanted for me. So I just did the best I could. No, that won't work. And any Jews sitting there reading what Paul's writing, they, they would, could, you could argue, well, I, I deserve heaven because number one, I'm a Jew, and number two, I have the Torah. Therefore, God should let me in. And Paul's going to say, uh, that's not how you get justified. Uh, how does God judge Gentiles when he didn't give them the law? I mean, is that fair? I mean, if God didn't give the Gentiles uh, the law, special revelation on Mount Sinai, I mean, how is it fair that he would then judge you in eternity uh, with eternal punishment when he didn't explicitly tell you? Well, Paul says, uh, Gentile is just as culpable, just as a Jew. He, he just has the moral law, natural law, encoded from the very beginning. So does the Jew, but God gave them the special revelation. They're really responsible. Now, skip verse 13. We'll come back to it in a minute. Look at verse 14. Paul says, for when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these, these Gentiles, not having the law, they're a lot of themselves. And what in the world is he talking about? That you instinctively know right from wrong. This is called natural law. It's called moral law. It's built into the fabric of the cosmos. Everybody just knows. There are certain things you don't do, like stealing, murder, lying, only three. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we could have a whole sermon series on, you know, just natural law, the things that are wrong. Well, just things that we know, right? Things that he says, we know these things instinctively. The Gentiles know that, like I said, that Toranic law is written on their heart. They know it. C.S. Lewis was a devout atheist. As a young man, he loved to trash Christians. And his, uh, his grenade, I mean, the way he blew them away was the whole concept of evil. You know, when I, when I uh, started my doctoral program, and by the way, I finished my last correction on my dissertation Tuesday. Praise God, I'm done. So, <laughs> <laughs> I sit around at night looking at Liz going, 
got nothing to do. <laughs> you know? So we've gone shopping a whole bunch of times because I love to shop. But anyway, um, <laughs> and I actually stacked up a whole bunch of books yesterday in my office and said, I can actually pick what I want to read. It's awesome. I know it's weird, but it's just me. Uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, first class I took with Dr. Geisler two and a half years ago for the doctoral program was a class called On Evil, The Problem of Evil. Because people like C.S. Lewis would use these as grenades. It, you know, here's kind of how the argument goes. You know, if there is a God, you know, and he's a good God, then why would he permit evil? Therefore, since evil exists, the summation of the syllogistic argument is, there's no God. There's no God. Well, let, read in mere Christianity and analyze what C.S. Lewis, the devout atheist, had to say when he had a come to Jesus moment. So I was ordained Southern Baptist, sorry. Um, <laughs> He says, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But then I, I, I started wondering, how did I get this idea of, of just and unjust? A man does not call the line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. Isn't that the truth? Now, I, I am not laissez-faire. I'm the antithesis of laissez-faire. So I'm type A, like AA. So like when my neighbor the other day put in a mailbox that was crooked already, and he, he went, I'm just saying. Wanted to straighten the mailbox. He didn't use a level. What's a level for? Make straight. And you can eyeball it and guess what? You got something with your eyes because it's not straight. You can step back and go, that's straight. You put a level on it, it's like it's not, the bubble's not, uh-uh. And, and so when I had a neighbor, you know, on my street put in a mailbox to try to straighten it the other day and I'm, I'm like, I looking at it going, oh man, I, I don't even know if I can handle this. You know, <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, you know, and if I walked across the street with a four-foot level, that's the end of the friendship, you know. <laughs> and I was like, hey, could we talk? You know, like, what's the level for it? Well, it's kind of eyeballing. That's kind of crooked. But, uh, you know, you, he says you can't know something's, something's crooked unless it, you know what straight is. Then he says, what, what I, was I comparing this universe, what, what, what was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? Of course, I could have given up my idea of justice by saying it was nothing but a private idea of my own. But if I did that, even my argument against God collapsed too. For the argument depended on saying that the world was really unjust. Not simply that it did not happen to please my private fancies. He then says, thus in the very act of trying to prove that God did not exist, in other words, that the whole of reality was senseless, I found I was forced to assume that one part of reality, namely the idea of justice, was full of sense. Where'd that come from? He says, consequently, atheism turns out, he's an atheist, used to be. Uh, he says, consequently, atheism turns out to be too simple. Whoa. He says, if the whole universe has no meaning, we should have never found out that it had no meaning. <laughs> Don't you like C.S. Lewis? He's just kind of like, I want to underline that and memorize that. Yeah, how did you know it didn't have any meaning? I can only measure it against God who has up ultimate meaning. So if you know his life, what happened to him? Became a believer. Why? Logical reasoning based on the facts. He understood sin. How do you understand sin? Ultimate measure, God. Now, in case you're like in the legal area of the world, which is a lot of people in our uh, culture here, I'll give you a syllogistic argument. Moral law argument. This is a syllogistic argument. It can be no better than the components of said syllogism, correct? So look at major premise number one. What's it say? What does it say? Every moral law has a moral lawgiver. Right? You walk into the Supreme Court and go, hey, where'd you guys get all these laws? I don't know, man. Just kind of, they were there. Yeah, right. Okay. The moral law. You know. Okay, second minor premise leads to, well, there is objective moral law. We can't get around that because it's a subjective moral law. We got issues. You can never get a traffic ticket. I'm kind of feeling it's 85 and a 25. Anyway, <laughs> minor premise. Okay. <laughs> Logical conclusion Try that when you get a ticket. Uh, logical conclusion is what? There must be an objective moral lawgiver, i.e. God. This is, this is what Lewis is really talking about. You know, th those people that go to universities, uh, young people, and write home or call home or text home or whatever they do today to say, hey, dear mom and dad, having an awesome time. I'm thinking of throwing Christianity to the wind because I'm buying into all of the evolutionary thinking uh, that I'm being told here. And I think it's viable. Really. Is that the logical viewpoint? No. Why? Because you can't, under the concept of moral law, explain where it came from from a scientific perspective. 
It's a metaphysical problem for those people. Yeah, there's a man named Paul Copin. I was reading him for another doctoral class I took the other day. Uh, he wrote this uh, defense of the concept of moral law. It's an amazing article. I'll just summarize what he says in this for those who want to believe in atheism. Because if you're an atheist, like, like Lewis said, where does your concept of morality really come from? Uh, the best option I'm going to say is theism. Here's what uh, Paul Copin says. He says, the affirmation of human dignity, rights, and duties is something we would readily expect if God exists, but not if humans have emerged from valueless, mindless processes. He says, the naturalist context of a series of impersonal, valueless causes and effects producing valuable beings is shocking and utterly incongruous given the outcome. He says, if intrinsic value does not exist from the outset, I'm an evolutionary thinking, uh, its emergence from non-valuable processes is difficult to explain. No kidding. It doesn't matter how many non-personal, non-valuable components we happen to stack up. From valuelessness comes valuelessness, not value. In the case of morality, we're still left wondering how value and obligation came to be thrust upon a value, uh, uh, valueless context of unguided matter in motion to have a context for the truth that murder's wrong. Where'd that come from? Well, it was just a valueless, primordial sea of this and that. And, and out popped on the other end, eons later, that certain things were just wrong. Really? That's the best answer? No, I think the best answer is theism. There is a God who has set the standard of what is absolutely true and not true. And we are moral because we understand he's the ultimate of morals. You know, Dr. Geiser gave us one day in class uh, eight reasons why uh, moral law is just kind of there. And I'll give them to you. I'll summarize them. Uh, number one, we know it's there because moral law is undeniable. We know it's there. We know it's there. Now, you might be saying, yeah, cultures do things differently, and, and there's not absolute morals. Well, the, the minute you say there's not absolute morals, you made a moral absolute statement, so therefore I rest my case. But anyway, um, <laughs> do I need to say that again? Yeah, okay. The minute you say there is not moral absolutes, that's an absolute statement. You absolutely prove my position. You follow? And, and, and this is what Geiser says. Moral law is undeniable. You can't get around it. It's around there. And it, it's absolute in, it, in its being there. Number two, he says, we know it by our reactions that there's moral law. That Go to the DMV and wait in a long line. You know what I mean? Then you're standing there and there's 6,000 people in front of you. And somebody steps in front of you in line. How do you feel? What do you do? Tap them on the shoulder. Praise God for you. <laughs> you grab the shirt collar and throw them out of line. I've done that before when I was younger. Not a good option. Uh, but something bad's happened, you know? Why? Because moral law. So you just tap on my shoulder. Hi, buddy. I believe in moral law. There's absolutes. You're out of here, dude. You know? <laughs> Number three. You believe in moral law. Why? It's the basis of human rights. Translated, you couldn't have a human right, an alienable human right, unless it's measured against God. Four. Uh, it exists because it's the unchanging standard of justice, meaning you wouldn't know what is justice unless you knew one who's absolutely just. Five, it defines the real difference between moral positions. I ask the question, what's the difference between an ISIS warrior and a U.S. soldier? <laughs> are they the same? N are they the same? No. no, diametrically opposed, are they not? Because what does this one not have? Morals. Morals. What's he going to do with the prisoner? Kill him, torture him, whatever. What are they going to do with him? Treat him with respect, dignity, care, compassion, court of law, whatever. I mean, the whole situation's different. You wouldn't even know the difference between those if you didn't know the God of absolute morality. What do you do in battle and not do in battle? Well, thank God we have a nation, that Judeo-Christian concept, that understands how to treat people even if it's your enemy. But they don't have that concept. You wouldn't know the difference if you didn't know there was a God. He says, since we know what's absolutely wrong, there must be an absolute moral standard of rightness. True. Seven, moral law is the grounds for political and social dissent. Absolutely. I would love to like walk through a crowd of demonstrators, whatever they're demonstrating, anti-gun, pro-gun, pro-this, pro whatever. And I would like to ask them some questions like, do you believe in absolute moral law? Because I have a hunch knowing my culture the majority of them are going to say, hey, no, man, I'm relativist in law, moral law. It's just like what I do is what I do. And what you do is what you do. Why are you demonstrating? You follow? Because you couldn't demonstrate unless you have an absolute standard of why you demonstrate. Anyway, 
And then lastly, he says, if there's no moral law, then why would we make excuses for violating it? When I was, <laughs> this is a funny one. I mean, when I was a sheriff chaplain, I mean, I heard from all the 1,300 officers, like, what would happen on traffic stops? You know, when you get pulled over, the window goes down, you don't want to say two eggs over easy with, you know, and that doesn't go well. I had a friend do that. You don't want to do that. <laughs> I actually had a friend that did that. It did go well for him. Um, you get pulled over, people are coming up with all kinds of excuses. Hey, officer, I, you know, a bee flew in. Really? Your windows are up. Well, you know, sneaky little things, aren't they? Uh, you know, my team just lost. I was having a heartbreak moment. I mean, something. All these lame excuses. All of a sudden, you believe in moral law when the officer approaches the car. You know, you're making all kinds of excuses. You just broke the moral law. And, you know, in case you don't believe it, 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 it those are eight points why moral law is there. Geisler adds a ninth one. No, those are his eight. Paul adds a ninth one. It's called, verse 14, your conscience. You've got one. Have you listened to it lately? You have one? Did, did you like Jiminy Cricket? Remember him? Jiminy Cricket. What's he got to do with theology? This guy's all over the map. <laughs> Let your conscience what? Be your guide. Is that a good way to live life? Well, if you have a stained moral conscience from sin, well, the conscience can well tell you to do some really bad things if it's not a good conscience. But we all have a conscience. That's what Paul says. We're all born with it. And what's the conscience do? Does the conscience create law, moral law? No. It just tells you, hello, you shouldn't be doing an 85 and a 25, but it feels so good. No, you, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. See, the, the, that's the little voice coming along and telling you. It's the conscience. Where's the conscience come from? God put it there. You should do this. You should not do that. And then after you commit something that you shouldn't do, it's there to con convict you. Uh, I took Nathan with Liz. Uh, he works for the FCC now. They hired so many uh, special needs people to work for the FCC. So he has a job downtown. So he takes the VRE downtown every morning and gets up at four to go to work and he, he's enjoying his job. But he went with a little buddy and his mom to New York this weekend. So it, we're finally, it's quiet at my house. Uh, I told him I was going to sell the house while he's gone. But uh, yeah, he's like, whoa, uh, you got a kid with your kids occasionally. But um, we told him, we'll be there for you when you get back. So he taught us how to ride the VR8. We've never done it. Liz and I dropped him off down there, got in the bus station at Union Station. We hung around D.C. all afternoon, got back on the VRE. I've never ridden it before, right? I don't know the rules. Train pulls up. I see an empty car. We walk on. We want to sit upstairs. And Liz gets a seat. I get a seat. We sit down, and it's totally quiet and relaxing, kind of chilling. It's kind of nice. And... Um, all of a sudden, some lady across the aisle, you know, the expanse, you know, she goes, Pastor Marty and Liz! <laughs> you kidding me? The church is everywhere. It's unbelievable. And yes, hey, how are you? It's great, fantastic. And we're talking and sharing, and it's really loud and everything. All of a sudden, I, I feel like somebody's yelling at me. So I, <laughs> I look down below, and there's this big burly dude, shaved head, earphones. He pulls them out. Hey, buddy! Like, hey, yeah, what? I thought it was another prisoner but it wasn't. He's like, do you realize that this is a quiet car? <laughs> no, no, no. Do you realize you're talking to? Uh, I didn't say that. This is a quiet voice. So, yeah. So then, you know, the sinful side wants to step in. Uh, I said, thank you for being here to tell me what I'm supposed to do. And he sat back down, put his earphones in. Now, had I read the doors when I came in, because <laughs> I just blew by them. Empty car, we're the first in. If you read the doors of the quiet car, have you? What does it say? It's a quiet car. No talking, no loud music, no cell phone talking. I mean, I didn't read any of the Ten Commandments of the quiet car. <laughs> right. Now, had I read them and known them as I'm sitting there and the prisoner goes psycho over there, <laughs> I could have went, <laughs> the conscience would have kicked in. And had we began talking, the conscience would have kicked in and told me what? Don't do that. It's against the law. The conscience. We've all got one. You got one? Paul says, we know there's moral law because we have a conscience that tells us there's moral law. So then what, what's the upshot of that? Verse 13. For it's not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law which shall be justified. Is Paul saying, well, is he saying that you get into heaven based on your obedience to the law? No. He's setting up a theoretical situation. He goes, oh, you know, you're a Jew and you want to get into heaven based upon obedience? Well, then it's got to be total obedience to the law. All of it, all of the time, no deviation ever. Perfect. And if you're a Gentile and you want to get into heaven based upon the law, you want to be justified before God, we have our sin problem just like the Jew does, and you'll have to be just as obedient to the internal moral law as they will be to the Torah. 
And since that can't ever happen, well, he's, he's, in chapter 3, he's going to tell you you need to turn to Jesus who fulfilled the law. But in verse 16, he says, uh, you need to wake up. Why? One day when according to my gospel, God will judge what? The secrets of men through who? Through Christ Jesus. Like all the things that you did that nobody else knew about, that you thought you got away with. I mean, all those conflicts in your conscience that you didn't listen to the good voice, you didn't do the evil voice, all those compromises, God says, let's put them on view. If your life's not covered by the blood of Christ, then it's just you as the law. Here's the facts. So that when you step into eternity without God and are punished, it's totally just and impartial. It's based upon all the evidence. Far better to come to Christ, isn't it? Why? Well, he was the ultimate Jew, the God-man who bore my sin, bore your sin, fulfilled the law to the letter, never sinned, went to the cross, rose the third day, and what's he doing? He's calling out to people in a spiritual stupor, telling them, you need to wake up and come to me, and he'll redeem. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the opportunity to open the words of Paul. Uh, what a great saint, uh, articulate thinker was he. Uh, might our thinking match Paul's thinking? Might uh, his passion for the cross, for the empty tomb, be our passion. And anyone among us that plays games with eternity, might this be the day that they come and talk to a counselor afterward and say, I want, I want to know Christ today. You will stand ready as the good shepherd to bring the sheep home. Thank you for your love for us, and we love you back in Christ's name. Amen.